We don't you. want to have that kind of public persona when then we'd be vulnerable to charges that were unpatriotic. It'll make it more difficult to keep pace with the flag waivers at Fox or CNN or whatever. And more broadly, news media are very worried, not only government pressure, but advertiser pressure, criticism from readers, listeners, and viewers. Gee, our soldiers are in the field. You gotta support them. Don't raise these tough questions. It seems to me that the right thing to do for patriots when American lives are at risk and Americans are dying is to unite behind the troops until victory is won. Now on this show, Buchanan and Press, we've had a good debate for eight months on this conflict, but now it seems when the war comes, the debate ends. I think unity, Bill, is essential at this time, or at least when the guns begin to fire. It's a very effective tactic, at least in the short run, to a large extent, to say, look, you've got to support the troops. You're killing the troops! And that's an You're effort to conflate supporting the troops with supporting the president's policies. Once the war against Saddam begins, we expect every American to support our military, and if they can't do that, to shut up. In addition to Phil Donahue, Many other journalists have been silenced for crossing the mythical line known as objectivity. Today, NBC News fired journalist Peter Arnett this morning for participating in an interview on Iraqi state-controlled television. Arnett criticized American war planning and said his reports about civilian casualties in the Iraqi resistance were encouraging to anti-war protesters in America. If you're pro-war, you're objective, but if you're anti-war, you're biased. And often a news anchor will get no flack at all for making statements that are supportive of a war and wouldn't dream of making a statement that's against a war. I must say I was trying to think of I was trying to think of something that would be appropriate to say on an occasion like this and as is often the case the best you can come up with is something that Shakespeare wrote for Henry V wreak havoc and unleash the dogs of war. And that is a tip off to just how skewed the media terrain is. We should keep in mind that CNN, which many believe to be a liberal network, had a memo from their top news executive, Walter Isaacson, in the fall of 2001, as the missiles were falling in Afghanistan, telling the anchors and the reporters, you need to remind people, anytime you show images on the screen of the people who were dying in Afghanistan, you've got to remind the American viewers that it's in the context of what happened on 9-11, as though people could forget 9-11. Well, we talked to several people who told us that uh, various friends and relatives had died in the bombing there, in that collateral damage. Nick Robertson, CNN, Kandahar, Afghanistan. And we would just remind you, as we always do now with these reports from inside the Taliban-controlled Afghanistan, that you're seeing only one side of the story, that these U.S. military actions that uh, Nick Robertson was talking about are in response to a terrorist attack that killed 5,000 and more innocent people inside the United States. Kandahar, and we juxtapose what we're hearing from the Taliban with a live picture of the cleanup that continues in Lower Manhattan, ground zero, again, a 24-hour operation that has not ebbed. 5,000 killed that day back on Tuesday, September 11th, their biggest crime, as civilians going to work that day. And yet, we know statistically, the best estimates tell us, that more civilians were killed by that bombing in Afghanistan than those who died in the Twin Towers in New York. And the moral objections uh, that could be raised to slaughtering civilians in the name of retaliation against 9-11, those objections were muted by the phrase war on terror, by the way in which it was used by the White House and Congress, and also by the news media. Free flows of information have been further blocked by a more general atmosphere of contempt for anti-war voices. And, uh, among them are uh, a group called Code Pink, which is headed by Medea Benjamin, who's a terrorist sympathizer, um, dictator, worshipping um, propagandist. The and, far left uh, element in America is a destructive force that must be confronted. Some Americans sadly not interested in victory, and yet they want us to believe that their behavior is patriotic. Well, it's not. What? To call the president stupid, he doesn't know much about anything, that's just great. Go with Danny Glover and Susan Sarandon. You <laughs> fit in to, perfect. To in any way be defending a torturer, a killer, uh, a dictator who used chemical weapons against his own people is pretty remarkable, but it's a very long tradition in the Democratic Party. Pay no heed to the peaceniks and the left-wing rock stars. 
They've had their 15 minutes of fame. These people are essentially useless. They are reflexively opposed to war. It's a principled position, but it's the wrong position, and you can't take them seriously as a strategic voice. Millions and billions of useless people out there. If you want to have democracy, you've got to have the free flow of information through the body politic. You can't have these blockages. You can't have the manipulation. While mainstream journalists have rarely called attention in real time to the failure of news media to provide necessary information and real debate, they have repeatedly pointed to their own failures well after wars have been launched. During the course of this war, there was a lot of snap too in press coverage. We're at war, the world's changed, we have to root for the country to some extent. And yet it seems something missing from this debate was a critical analysis of where it was taking us. Those of us in journalism never even looked at the issue of occupation. Because? Because, because it just didn't occur to it. We weren't smart enough. You had to have gone against the grain. Right, you'd also come it. off as kind of a pointy head trying to figure yeah. out some obscure issue exactly. here. Yeah, it's no, good no. guys and bad yeah, guys. Negative. Yeah, negative. Yeah, negative. News media down the road will point out that there were lies about the Gulf of Tonkin or about weapons of mass destruction in Iraq. I'm sorry to say, but certainly television and perhaps to an extent my station was intimidated by the administration and its foot soldiers at Fox News. We should have been more skeptical. But that doesn't bring back any of the people who have died, who were killed in their own country or sent over by the President of the United States to kill in that country. So after the fact, it's all well and good to say, well, the system worked or the truth comes out. But when it comes to life and death, the truth comes out too late. My fellow citizens, at this hour, American and coalition forces are in the early stages of military operations to disarm Iraq, to free its people, and to defend the world from grave danger. This will be a campaign unlike any other in the senior Iraqi military leadership. Bang, 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 bang. Once public support is in place and war is finally underway, the news media necessarily turn from covering the rationales for war to covering war itself. When the president decides he wants the U.S. to go to war, then the war becomes the product. Particularly in the early stages, news coverage of war is much more like PR about CBS. war. Influencing the nature of this war coverage has been a priority of one administration after another since Vietnam, when conventional wisdom held that it was negative media coverage that turned the American people against the war and forced U.S. withdrawal. Since that time, and beginning with new urgency during the 1991 Gulf War, the Pentagon has worked with increasing sophistication to shape media coverage of war. As then Defense Secretary Dick Cheney noted about the importance of public perceptions during the first Iraq war, frankly, I looked on it as a problem to be managed. The information function was extraordinarily important. I did not have a lot of confidence that I could leave it to the press. So for the invasion of Grenada and invasion of Panama in 83 and 89, then the Gulf War in early 1991, it was like a produced TV show, and the main producers were at the Pentagon. They decided, in the case of the Gulf War, exactly what footage would be made available to the TV stations. They did nonstop briefings, utilizing the increasing importance of cable television. They named it Operation Desert Storm. Breaking news of what's now officially called Operation Desert Storm. Good evening. Operation Desert Storm rages on. All that the sort of stuff was very calculated. So you could look at that as an era of media war manipulation from the standpoint of the US government. Then you had a different era. You had the invasion of Iraq in 2003. Scores of American reporters have now joined US military units in Kuwait as part of the Pentagon's effort to make any war with Iraq what the Pentagon calls a media-friendly campaign. Another part of that effort is on display at the U.S. Military Command Center in Qatar. A Hollywood set designer was brought in to create a $200,000 backdrop for official war briefings. And tied in with that is the worship of Pentagon technology. 
I've, I've, I've fallen almost in love with the F-18 Super Hornet because it's, it's quite a versatile plane. I got to tell you, my favorite aircraft, the A-10 Warthog. I love the Warthogs. This uh, morning around 4 a.m. local time, the first three took off, and when you're 300 feet away from them, when they do it, you hear it in your shoes and feel it in your gut. The Pentagon's influence on war coverage has also been evident in the news media's tendency to focus on the technical sophistication of the latest weaponry. Great Should they have used so. more? Should they, you know, use a Moab, the mother of all bombs, and well, a few <laughs> daisy cutters, and, right. you know, let's not just stop I, at a couple of cruise missiles. <laughs> the only the newest, biggest, baddest U.S. bomb. We'll and pound them with 2,000-pound bombs and then go 2, in. 2,000-pound bombs in urban areas? Oh, sure. The plane I'm holding in my hand here, the F-117 stealth fighter, was used in these attacks significantly. How do you steer this thing? I mean, there's no, I mean, you have a stick, is that right? Sure. We have a... Uh, both of us have matching center stick with left throttles. Uh, you can do every... Every war, we have U.S. news media that have praised the latest in the state-of-the-art killing technology from the present moment to the war in Vietnam. B-57s, the British call them Canberra jets. We're using them very effectively here in this war in Vietnam to dive bomb uh, the Viet Cong in these jungles beyond Da Nang here. Colonel, what's our mission we're about to embark on? Well, our mission today, sir, is to report down to the site of the ambush 70 miles south of here and attempt to uh, kill the VC. The Colonel has just advised me that that is our target area right over there. One, two, three, four, we dumped our bombs and now it's a tremendous G-load as we pull out of the dive. Oh, I know something of what those astronauts must go through. Well, Colonel, <laughs> it's a great way to go to war. And there's a kind of idolatry there. Some might see it as worship of the gods of metal. That's the JDAM. Uh, it is a 2,000-pound bomb uh, that is deadly accurate, uh, and that is the thing that is allowing us, it allowed us in Afghanistan and will allow us in this next conflict to be terribly accurate, terribly precise, and terribly destructive. Amazing. In fact, even as U.S. military technology has become increasingly sophisticated with the development of so-called smart bombs and other forms of precision-guided weaponry, civilian casualties now greatly outnumber military deaths a grim toll that has steadily increased since World War I. This is going to be the entire nine yards. It was a breathtaking display of firepower. There's kind of a, an acculturated callousness towards what happens at the other end of U.S. weapons. Behind the flight deck, the weapons officer who goes by the call sign Oasis will never see the ground or the target for that matter. The airfield is simply a fuzzy image on his radar. And this is another very insidious aspect of war propaganda. There's a bias involved where because the United States has access to high-tech military weaponry, that somehow to slaughter people from 30,000 feet in the air or 1,000 feet in the air from high-tech machinery is uh, somehow moral, whereas uh, strapping on a suicide belt and blowing people up is uh, seen as the exact opposite. The targeting capabilities and the care that goes into targeting to see that the precise targets are struck and that uh, other targets are not struck is as impressive as anything anyone could see. The care that goes into it, the humanity that goes into it, to see that uh, military targets are, are destroyed to be sure. Uh, but that uh, it's done in a way and in a manner and in a destruct in a direction and with a weapon that is appropriate to that very particularized target. The weapons that are being used today have a degree of precision that no one ever dreamt of. Within this war-friendly news frame, 
the Defense Department has also been successful in shaping actual war reporting. Its influence reached new levels with the embedding of journalists during the war in Iraq. The Pentagon tightly controlled the media during the 1980s. 